Yeah, we got lots of back. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to speak. I'll try to keep it brief. But I'll uh, keep us on time if we can. Um, as Ryan mentioned, uh, I've done a lot of research over the last uh, dozen or so years on many different topics related to the Red Wings history. Um, you, you may actually have seen uh, um, articles in the Red Wings yearbook that I've written over the last 10 or so years. Uh, one of the topics that I've spent a lot of time researching, as Ryan mentioned, is ballparks that the, the various Rochester professional teams have played in, uh, uniforms, all kinds of different historical aspects. But this one is a little more lighthearted, not quite as much research required. This was something I just thought would be a little bit of fun to talk about. And where this came from is uh, an article that I did last year uh, in the 2019 yearbook where I talked about all of the different names the Rochester uh, professional baseball teams have had, from the Rochesters to the Hopbitters to the Hustlers to the Colts, things like that. But also I've researched a lot about the uniforms that the teams have worn over the years. So this presentation is not about the former names the team has had, but rather the alternate identities that the team has adopted in the last few years. So what inspired this whole trend began around 2016 in the minors with two different teams who adopted alternate identities. So that is playing a game or two or three as a different identity. So the Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs played a game as the Lehigh Valley Cheese Steaks, uh, which is obviously a, a nod to the Philadelphia area. And the Fresno Grizzlies played a game as the Fresno Tacos. So that all started in 2016. And from there, that trend really was born and it really took off. So uh, both of these were food-based. Um, it's fairly often as well that teams, now that this trend has really started in, in the minors and some major league teams, do the throwback uniforms as well. Um, but the food-based identities are much more popular than throwback identities. So that's one of the things that the Red Wings have done particularly well in the last few years as well. So in order to inform this presentation, I got in touch with Tim Duhan from the team. Uh, the plates idea was to, was the excuse me plates okay was one of the first uh, alternate identities that the team adopted. The plates idea was the brainchild of Tim Duhan, the Red Wings social media and promotions manager, and he brought up the idea at a team planning session after the 2016 season. So as I was uh, conversing and trading emails with Tim, I asked about you know was there any other ideas considered. Like, what about White Hots, for example? And I liked Tim's response. He said, yes, other ideas were considered, such as White Hots, but ultimately the uniqueness and the aesthetic, or lack thereof, of a garbage plate, <laughs> a sense of pride they are for Rochesterians made it a no-brainer. So uh, the team worked with Brandios, a company based in San Diego. Um, if you study anything about minor league baseball design or know anything about uh, this kind of in, uh, this kind of topic. Brandios is definitely one of the, the most common uh, branding houses that works with minor league baseball teams on this type of thing. This is actually kind of an industry and a specialty in and of itself. Uh, so the team worked with Brandios, a company based in San Diego. Uh, they do a lot of rebranding for MILB teams. We gave them the concept and they started designing. We went back and forth for a few months uh, until we got the logo and uniform design just the way we wanted it. So, this was all announced July 4th, 2017. On July 4th, 2017, the team announced, the Rochester Red Wings are changing their name, for one night anyway. The Wings will take the field as the Rochester Plates on Thursday, August 10th at 7.05, paying homage to the cuisine most synonymous with our great city, the Garbage Plate. So, you may have seen this announcement, you may remember it. This really... This took Rochester by storm. This was only two and a half years ago, so it's not like it was that long ago. But according to Tim, we knew it was going to be successful, but it far exceeded our expectations. Our reaction in the front office when we announced it on July 4th was, holy crap, this is awesome. <laughs> we need to order more merchandise ASAP, and we have to put out an awesome show on August 10th. So August 10th was the day that this plates game was going to take place. So. I'll, I'll ask for a little audience participation. Who can tell me what happened on August 10, 2017? Big line. 
Yes. How did that plates game go? Was anyone there at the first one? Yeah, a lot of you, right? Describe the environment there. Chaos. Chaos, <laughs> right? Okay. So here's what it looked like. This is a photo I took on the, that day. So August 10, 2017 versus Norfolk Tides. 13,281 attended. It was the second largest Red Wings single game attendance ever. So that's actually one other topic I've written about is, is uh, attendance figures for the various Red Wings games. So there's been a lot of games that have had higher. So for example, the Orioles exhibitions, things like that. But in terms of regular season, normal games, it was the second highest ever. The game featured all kinds of plates related promotions, a Nick Tahoe's truck, plates themed food items, and plates themed entertainments. entertainment. And so it was so successful that during the game, it was announced that every Thursday home game would be a plates game the next season in 2018. <clears throat> so here's a little <coughs> information about 2018, continuing on. So the team uh, played every game, uh, every Thursday home game as the plates in 2018. Um, and toward the end of the season, the Plates 2.0 game, the second version of this, the team introduced new uniforms for that. So the previous, the previous uniforms were up on the right-hand corner there, those white ones. So the team introduced new black uniforms for that, um, a new hat. And you can kind of see in my photo over here, there was this uh, promotional thing that was put out that was exactly the same, I mean, not exactly the same in terms of the promotions, but in terms of setting that environment, celebrating the, the team name, celebrating the, the plate. All right, in, earlier in 2018, this was the first of the recent era of Red Wings throwback games. So not the Red Wings' first throwback game. There were a lot of throwback games played in the early 90s, especially as Silver Stadium was closing and the team was doing a lot of things to celebrate their past. But it was always played as the Red Wings, as far as I know, or at least as far as I remember. So this was the first one that I'm aware of where the Red Wings actually played a throwback game as an alternate identity. So more from Tim. We'd actually talked about doing a throwback night before the plates were even born. Once the plates idea came about, we tabled the throwback night. The history of baseball in Rochester is so rich that we really wanted to educate our fans on the history while also selling some cool merchandise. The fact that it was one of the more unique names and one of the first identities of professional baseball in Rochester all played into it. Then once we learned some of the backstory on the team name, we thought we could have a lot of fun with it. So I can tell you a little bit about the backstory because this is a topic I've researched as well. So Hop Bitters was actually one of the first Rochester professional baseball team names that wasn't Rochester's. So the owner of the team at the time actually owned a product called Hop Bitters, which was a medicinal aid kind of a, a purported cure-all. And so it was actually one of the earlier instances of like corporate sponsorship for a baseball team for a team name, and the stadium name was called that as well, Hot Bitters Field, which was the stadium at Union Street, which I've talked about in some of my past presentations. So instead of the one thing I found interesting, instead of going with an actual throwback uniform, um, there isn't a lot of research, or at least there wasn't at the time, in terms of what the actual Hot Bitters uniforms looked like. We do know now exactly what they looked like, but um, we the team ended up going with what is kind of nicknamed a faux-back design, F-A-U-X, faux, like instead of throwback, but faux-back, kind of a, a portmanteau on those couple of words. But, so it's an interesting concept, and the idea was that putting together a cool modern take on the old name would be a good way to sell merchandise, and as far as I know, it was successful. So once again, the team worked with Brandios to create the logos and the uniforms. Uh, once again, it was a collaborative effort with Brandios. We gave them our idea and they started designing. Again, it took two months of back and forth to get to the finished product. Uh, our thought was to put a modern spin on an over 100-year-old nickname. Uh, basically, what would the logo and jerseys look like if the Hot Bitters played in 2018? We also thought we had a better chance to sell more merchandise with this approach. And so, I mean, that's part of what it's about, you know, but it's also about celebrating the history of the team. So, in 2019, it was time to do it again. Uh, this year, it was the Hustlers. Again, the uniqueness of the name, the cool backstory of John Ganzel in the Billiards Hall, 
made for an interesting story to tell. So when you have a moment, if you feel compelled, there's lots of cool videos on the Red Wings website about um, how this all came to be. Um, I won't tell that story in the interest of time, but uh, another kind of a faux back design. The Hustlers was one of the team names in the early 1900s. Um, I want to say like 1908 for five or six years. I can look it up, but that's as best I remember. Um, unfortunately, the first, uh, uh, I have a typo there. It says the first plates game was delayed. It's supposed to be the first Hustlers game. The first Hustlers game was postponed, delayed, and then postponed due to rain um, on the 25th. And then the team ended up making it up on the September 1st of this year. Um, two different uniforms were worn. So the navy blue jerseys were worn the first time around, and then the same design, but in a white jersey, was worn the second time around. So here's uh, the trend continues. What's going to happen this year? What's going to happen with other teams? Um, the idea that I wanted to show here is that this trend has really just taken off. 2016 is where it all began with the cheese steaks uh, and the, the tacos, but you know, almost every team in the minors since then has adopted some form of alternate identity. There's been all kinds of different food-based identities, um, different, even political, like you can see that second one there is the Iowa caucuses. I think that was the <laughs> Iowa house. <laughs> so they're not all food-based, but you know, some of these are the pimento cheese, the pork roll. The idea is take whatever food your city is known for, design an identity around it, and, and slap it on a jersey, and maybe you can make a few bucks. You know, it's really gotten kind of, I won't say out of hand, but it really has proliferated in an interesting way. So, uh, more from Tim. Plates Hands Down was the most successful promotion we've ever done and outperformed our expectations. Uh, Hot Bitters merch definitely went quicker than expected and Hustlers was a little slower. And I'm thinking that was primarily due to the rain. Um, I think Plates will, and, and I asked, what, what do you think the future of this is? I think, the, I think Plates will be part of the Red Wings identity for years to come. I'm not sure if we'll continue to do the Fobac Nights or not, that's still TBD for 2020. But I'm sure there will be some sort of this trend continuing going forward, whether it be in the cards for the Red Wings or, or not. But you know, you can definitely see how it's caught on. So again, in terms of all the different historical research that I've done, you know, it's not the most weighty or heady topic. And it certainly didn't take me as long to research some of this as some of the other topics I've done, which I've literally worked for years on. But this was just something that piqued my personal interest, and I thought maybe uh, you know, kind of end us on a little bit lighter note. So uh, that's it for my slides. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I, I don't have a whole lot more you know, as far as this topic than what I've shown you. But if you do have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Sure. Were there talks with Nick Tahoe before the first plates? Um, Probably someone from the team can answer that better than I can. Yes. yes. Uh, they were right in. Yeah, uh, okay. they actually had a food truck uh, okay. on that night at well, it was so crowded on the we couldn't left get field the plaza. Yeah. Yeah. And my yes. other thing is, my name is John Gans. That's Ganzel without the L. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and a friend of mine here gave me a baseball card of John Gans. Okay. Thank you, John. Any, yeah. Anybody at the major league level do this? I know they've done some like the Negro Leagues uh, uh, nights, but anything that's as fun as this? Yeah, good question. So they definitely wear alternate uniforms, and you know, like you said, there's there's uh, Negro League uniforms that have worn. Have they ever changed their name for a game? That's a good question. I'm leaning toward. I can't think of an instance, but it's possible that there could be an instance or two where major league teams have kind of informally changed their names and Twitter handles for a game. That's a good question. I'll have to research that and, and, and think on that. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, do you know, do the teams have to get some kind of waiver, or you know, to play? Because otherwise they could theoretically change their name every day, you know what I mean? You're right. Um... This is something that minor league baseball um, accepted that we do. So I don't think anyone has done more than one a year, and you know it hasn't uh, it hasn't been an issue that I'm aware of anywhere. Because the, the wings do the plates every Thursday. Correct. Home Thursday, and they right? yes. 
And did, did you have to get something no. from the internet? No. Minor League Baseball probably owns the logos, right? No, we all own our own logos. But do they own their property or properties rights or distribution or anything? No, um, we own our own logo rights. We do pay royalties uh, that some of which come back to us uh, through minor league baseball, but yeah. That's the benefit of being registered community baseball. Registered community baseball. These are all good questions. Thank you. Um, anything else quick before we wrap up? Is there a favorite of yours of all the different teams that have done it? Oh, that's a good question. Well, one that I think is interesting is this one right here in the middle, where Buffalo played as the wing. You know, and that's obviously it's a little ironic, right? Because because we're the Red Wings, you know. But I mean, Buffalo wings the food, so that kind of makes sense. And they did that the night that we played as the Hustlers. When they did, when yeah, yeah, they played. Yes, we've played against them as the wings. Yes. Which again is, is kind of fun. <laughs> That's like when uh, you know the Atlanta Braves play as the Milwaukee Braves, and you know the, uh, there was a game where they were both wearing throwback uniforms, and it was Braves versus Braves for that game. I remember that. So, um, so my favorite. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'm kind of more of a traditionalist, so I do like the throwback books. Um, but I definitely think plates is pretty unique and pretty cool. I've been to. You know many of those plates games myself and I have the hat and the shirt and you know they are it's and I enjoy my share of garbage plates too I know it's hard to tell. <laughs> so, maybe, I said maybe that one's my favorite as far as the alternate identities go. Yeah I know. So any, anything else quick before we wrap oh, up? Oh I was just gonna say I think that, that uh, our plates event and subsequent sales did better than any others that I'm aware of. I would, I, I would find that hard to argue with, honestly. I mean, you know, I'll go back a couple slides. Look at that crowd. That's what 13,281 people look like. You know, and that's just kind of my quick trying to take a panoramic shot. But I have another photo that I took, which I didn't include, but it showed that left field concourse where the Nick Tahoe's truck was. And it was people like yeah. like oh. this. It was like worse than any photo of Disney you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, I mean, it was a crazy environment there. It was an electric. Yeah, it was yeah. really yeah. just. 1130 at night. Um, yeah. yeah. But the other thing I remember is the night that they made the announcement, that just like the, the initial black materials, uh, the first night, it just was gone. Yeah. That very yeah. night that they even right. announced it in July. It yeah. just, Sold out like right there. You had to go in and like start ordering all kinds of stuff for the 20 day in online sales. Yeah. Oh, one question. Yeah. What was the largest? Um, well, I want to say it was the Hideki Arabo game in '97. As far as more I, than the first yeah. game ever. I think so. Yes. Yeah. I can actually, when we're done, I have I, I can pull up the list. Yeah, I know you've written the, the research that I've done. Yeah, I think that was the second largest. Orioles was the first. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He means those, those yeah. regular. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I think in terms of regular games, I think it was the Hideki Rabu game in the last seven. And we're not talking huge numbers. That might have been thirteen five. You know, it wasn't a big difference. Right. Yeah. Yeah.